welcome to the show. I'm your host, Brian Rogers. And if there's one thing Canadian investors seem to be craving in early 2023, it's a little more certainty. Research from CIBC World Markets suggests that Canadians pumped $4.2 billion into so-called covered call funds during 2022. For those who aren't familiar, those funds write call options on a portion of their stock portfolios. The aim is to provide a high income yield that may help offset market declines to some degree. And some of those funds add an extra twist into the mix. They use leveraged or borrowed money to help further enhance their yield potential in exchange for some added risk and volatility. There can be a lot of added complexity with these funds, but when they work, the reward can be enticing for income minded investors. Well, those leveraged high yield income funds are a staple of our guest speaker, Adrian Starinari from Passive Income Investing. He's going to help us unpack how they work and some of his considerations when researching them. Adrian, welcome back to our program. Great to see you again. Glad to be here. Thanks, Brian. Adrian, I know you've, uh, you've been with us before, but for those that have not watched one of your webinars, can you explain your investing style in general? Sure, not a problem. So I consider myself a long-term buy and hold income oriented investor. So I'm, I'm in it for the long term. I, I don't buy low to sell high. I, I typically buy things that are cash flow driven. So, you know, the covered call strategy or ETFs and funds that use covered cost strategies, which increases the income uh, is my portfolio's bread and butter. So I'm in it for the long term. I hold a lot of ETF, mostly funds, I don't hold many single stocks, if not at all, that use covered cost strategies, uh, which gives me my consistent monthly income, which I, which I live off of and which has allowed my wife and I to retire at, at, at a young age. So the, the whole premise behind this investing style or my, my personal investing style is creating your own paycheck, right? So that's what we did. So it, 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 it basically, without it, we wouldn't be here. So we're definitely enjoying it. Oh, I love that idea. Living the dream. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right. Just a quick reminder for our audience. If you want to hear more about Adrian and Erica's investing journey, check out the video. We have a video that's called Why We Use High Yield Income Strategies in an Early Retirement that uh, Adrian had done with us before. So it's available in the Learning Center on Web Broker and on TD's YouTube page. All right, Adrian, I'm looking forward to hearing about how leverage funds help you maintain your retirement lifestyle. But before we dive into our conversation, a quick note to our audience that we're discussing Adrian's approach to using leverage funds based on his specific circumstances. It's not intended to be financial advice that's broadly applicable to everyone. Make sure to evaluate your financial goals and needs before making any decisions. And with that said, let's jump into it. Okay, first off, Adrian, what does it mean when an investment fund is leveraged? So leverage is basically borrowed money. I mean, it's not rocket science. If you have a mortgage, you're leveraging your house, which is your asset, to borrow money from the bank, right? If your house is worth a million dollars, you take a uh, $250,000 mortgage or a home line of credit, that's basically 25% leverage. And your asset is your collateral. So if it's uh, your house, it's your house. I don't know whether it's a mortgage, it's a house. If it's a stock portfolio, well, it's the assets in that portfolio. So what fund managers do for, we're, we're talking about ETFs here, of course, in today's video, is that on a portion of the portfolio, let's say 25%, because it's a very common number, they will borrow some cash to invest, you know, more in, in the portfolio and more of the stock. So you kind of have 25% leverage it's called right so you 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 participate in 25 percent more growth you get 25 percent more yield uh, especially if it's a yield oriented etf but you also get 25 percent more downside if let's say the portfolio goes down so basically you're you're increasing your 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 portfolio returns or downside so leverage that's basically it borrowed borrowed money okay yeah i think a lot of us get confused or maybe a little pe people get a bit concerned on the term leverage but we're using it all the time like, like you said the example with uh, with your home ownership well now there are two different types of leveraged funds out there and many are aimed at short-term trading those are the ones that you hold so can you describe the sort of leverage funds that suit your investing goals as a, as a long-term investor the leverage i'm talking about here 
is really when fund managers of ETFs that are well diversified, typically blue chip oriented, borrow 25% of the assets to really increase a little bit the, the yield, you know, by 25%, the, the total return over time. There's other leverage funds that are more like daily leverage. And I don't know exactly how they work, but sometimes you'll see like 2x daily bull or 2x daily bear. And those are more designed for trading. You could get, you know, very high quick returns uh, if you trade them right. But that's not what my investing style is about. Great, great. Yeah, I know I've seen a lot of those ones, those triple leveraged bear ETFs and, you know, the bullish and so on. So those aren't what you're looking at. I'm, I'm glad to hear it because uh, I think those can be, can be pretty risky and definitely more for that short-term investor. So what are some of the potential benefits and risks of these income-oriented leverage funds that, that you like? Yeah, so we'll start with the benefits, of course. So the benefits is you're, you're basically getting 25% more performance of whatever the fund does. So if the fund has, you know, a 10% yield, for example, you'll get 12 and a half. If a fund goes up, you know, 10%, it'll, you'll ca your capital is going to appreciate by uh, 12 and a half percent. So it basically amplifies your returns and your yield. So that's the main benefit. The disadvantage is, of course, if the fund goes down, if the stock market goes down and, you know, if, let's say it's a, uh, an ETF that holds healthcare stocks, if the whole healthcare sector goes down and you have a leveraged healthcare ETF, well, you will go down exactly what the overall healthcare stocks in that fund go down uh, by the same amount plus 25%. So it's going to go down a little bit more. So the, you have to be ready for basically 25% more volatility. As a long-term investor who really intends to buy and hold long-term and someone who holds cash flow ETFs, leverage you know, in, in my opinion, of course, ma makes sense because you, you really want that extra boost long term and you're not so much worried about the day to day or month to month volatility. You have to expect that. Uh, and a lot of people don't have the emotions to deal with that. And that's completely fine. That maybe leverage is not for you. OK, so speaking of, of staying in check. You know, retirees generally seek safety and predictability from their investments. So why are you comfortable holding leverage funds, even though they might carry a little bit of a higher risk? What you're applying lever leverage to or the underlying ETF or the stocks inside the fund that's leverage is really the key to determine the risk. Uh, also, the leverage amount, right? 25% is very modest leverage. 50% or higher, then, then we're getting more, more risky, obviously. But the key is really the underlying. You know, for me, because I'm not a, a, a millionaire, I don't have millions and millions of dollars, uh, leverage definitely helped to, you could say, retire early or provided that extra boost, that 25% boost of income where, you know, I, all of a sudden, I, you know, you don't need two, three million dollars. You could do it with, with, with less. You could retire with less because... Uh, applying that that modest leverage helps your yield, which helps increase your, your monthly cash flow. How might leverage impact the distributions and yields of these funds? Yeah, definitely. So if you're applying 25% leverage, you're you're gonna you're gonna apply, you're gonna get 25% more yield or 25% more income. If you have 25% leverage on a fund that gives 10%, uh, you'll get 12.5%. Now it's not uh, it's not going to be interest income like a GIC. It could be multiple forms of income. In Canada, we have several. We have interest. There's eligible dividends. These are profits or dividends that come from Canadian dividend stocks, which is taxed uh, better. Then there's actually capital gains income, which is very important for my style of investing or covered call ETFs because covered call ETFs make the bulk of their income with covered call writing or options writing, selling covered calls. So monthly income that you get, some of it, or a majority of typically covered call ETFs, the majority of that income is classified as capital gains, which is taxed really well in Canada. Adrian, for those that may not know in the audience on what a call option is or a covered call for that matter, can you just in broad strokes, take us through what those, uh, those two types of investments are? Sure. And I'll try not to confuse people. So the easiest way that I've determined to, to try to explain this is, first of all, you have to people need to understand that there is 
stock market where shares or stocks are traded, but there's also an options market where options on those stocks are traded. So when it comes to a call, it's a buy option. So there, there's two types of options, right? There's a, there's a buy option, that's a call option. Then there's a sell option, which is called a put option. So a call option is an option to buy a stock. So if you're selling a, a, a call, let's say you own a TD stock, um, you could tell someone or give someone the option to buy TD stock off of you for a predetermined price. So that's called a strike price. And typically a contract is a month or two months. So let's say TD stock is $100. You sell a call at 105 to another investor. The investor has to give you a premium for that. They have to pay you a little something, something for that, right? That's called the premium. Just like when you pay an insurance company a monthly premium for whatever insurance you have. So let's say you get $2 for that, okay? And let's say after 30 days, let's say the stock ends at $103. That call would expire worthless because it will only get exercised uh, if the stock re goes over $105. So if TD stock, you know, after 30 days stays at 100, goes to 101, 102, 105, right at, right at that break even point or lower, well, you get to keep that $2 premium and you get to keep your TD shares. But if the TD stock goes to 108, for example, you have to sell your TD shares to the investor at 105. He will definitely exercise his right to buy, which means you lose the $3 capital gain between 105 and 108, but you got $2, which cushions your, your loss to only $1. So that's typically the mechanic of a covered call on one stock. So if, if you have a covered call ETF, the fund managers are writing these call options or these buy options on a portion of the portfolio to generate all these premiums. Why is it called covered? Well, be, if you have to, if TD stock goes to 108 and you have to sell it, you're covered because you already own the TD stock. That's why it's called a covered call. So you're, you're owning the stock, you, you're, you're owning the underlying you're writing calls on, so you're covered in case you have to sell. Well, I want to get down a little bit more granular and talk about a particular type of fund. So I want to focus on a particular type of fund that you like, which is covered call funds that carry modest leverage. Can you explain how these funds work at a high level? It's basically a... a, a a regular ETF that holds, let's say, 20 stocks, 20 dividend, blue chip dividend stocks, typically. And they do covered call writing on a portion of the portfolio. But every time you write these calls, you're, you're earning premium. So that's how these covered call ETFs generate that higher monthly income. You're, you're, you're generating premiums every time you're writing calls. And the more aggressive the call is, the, the higher the premium is. So you get those premiums plus the dividends of the portfolio, if they're dividend stocks, you're still getting those dividend stocks. So that ends up increasing your yield because now you have two components instead of one, the dividends and the covered call premiums. Then if you add leverage, it just leverages both of those components. So all of a sudden you can get to 10% yield easily with these ETFs, which is fantastic. The goal is really to generate higher income. That is the goal of covered call writing. It's to generate higher income, higher yield, and actually lower your volatility or lower your risk. So a lot of people automatically associate higher yields with higher risk. In this case, covered calls, it's actually the opposite. It's higher yield and lower risk. They work really well when the market is not really doing much or in a down market because those calls are not going to be exercised. You're getting higher yields and that leverage helps you get higher yields even more so and that income, that increased income helps cushion declining stock prices uh, during a bad year. So that's where these ETFs actually shine. It's during the flat markets, during the down markets, but you're, 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 you're going down 25% more, let's say, in stock price, right? And then when, when the market goes up, you, yes, you're going to go up as well, 25% more if there's leverage, but covered call ETFs don't go up as much during a sharp rally. So there's going to be always some drag there. How much you're giving up really depends on 
portfolio coverage? Are they writing it on 33% of the portfolio, 25%, 50%? That's factor number one, portfolio coverage. Factor number two is the moneyness of the calls. So if the, there's out of the more out of the money they are, the less aggressive they are, the more capital you could you could get, but the smaller the premiums are. So you could actually, you know, enable options trading in your own brokerage account, in your TD account, and you could write your own calls and everything like that. But that's not something I do. I want to completely passive. I've never written a call in my life. I understand how it works, but I've never written a, a, a call option in my life because uh, I think it's, you know, it's kind of risky. I, I'd rather leave that to the fund managers who are specialized in covered call writing. That's all they do. They're specialists. And every fund has a different strategy. So that's another thing you need to consider. So that's essentially what a covered call ETF is. And if you add a leverage, add leverage, it, it's like any other ETF, you're just adding 25% more, uh, you know, vol you're getting 25% more upside, more yield, and more downside and volatility. It sounds like the fund manager is going to be pretty busy, you know, doing all these covered call transactions. And you said, you know, you're leaving it to the experts, that kind of thing. Does that translate into any larger fees, like in terms of a management expense fee at all? They do. Yeah, they do. So cover call ETFs take more work because of the fund managers are writing calls. So they're typically in Canada, the average cover call ETF is about 0.65 to 0.85% management fee. If you compare that to, let's say, a regular dividend ETF, they're typically 0.35%. And then if you go to an index ETF, it's much, much lower. Some, some of them are you know, under 0.2 or some of them are even under 0.1, they're peanuts. So one drawback, of course, for that higher income is th these ETFs do have higher uh, management fees. And if there's, you know, there's, they borrow money, there's leverage, there's interest expenses. So that all goes into the MER. So that's why sometimes with these leverage funds, you could see the MER, which includes leverage costs, you know, in the high ones, you know, 1.5 up, up to even 2%. Um, so the drawback, you know, it is a drawback, higher fees, but it's it's completely normal, right? Because there's more work that goes into the fund. These are really specifically designed for a really a particular investor who really is prioritizing monthly income, monthly cash flow above total return. Just a quick note for our audience. If you'd like to learn more about cover call ETFs, Check out our webinar on how to generate passive options income on a budget in the Learning Center, and then uh, you can get much more additional information either in Web Broker or from TD's YouTube page. So next, what I wanted to move to, Adrian, is that the other type of leverage fund you do like is split funds. So you mentioned it a little bit earlier, but can they can be a little bit more complicated. How do they work at a high level? Yeah, it took me a while to understand them myself. So th they are closed end funds. That's the first thing you need to that people need to understand. So ETFs are open ended funds, right? So they they're the buying and trading. There's not a set number of shares. Closed end funds means there's a set number of shares, and for a fund manager to issue more shares, they kind of have to do what's called an an offering. So there's a set number of shares, and what happens with a closed end fund is that sometimes a net asset value. You know, all funds have a net asset, mutual funds have a NAV, ETFs have a NAV. That's what the fund is actually worth, the intrinsic value of it. And then there's a the stock price. There's the market price. So what is it worth? What is it trading for right now on the stock market? Two completely different things. For open-ended funds like ETFs, the NAV and the stock price are typically neck and neck. For closed-end funds, because of how they're, they're structured, there could be a big disconnect between what the fund is worth and what you need to pay for it. And typically, they, they, they trade at premiums, which means, let's say the NAV is $10, but on the stock market, it's $12. So you're, if you want to invest in this fund that's worth $10, you got to pay $12. You got to pay a 20% premium. But if it's worth $10 and it's trading for $9, you're buying it at a 10% discount. So that's how the disc, what the discount and premium is on closed end funds. So that's the first thing you need to be aware of when it comes to not only split share funds, but all closed end funds, because there could be a big disconnect. So split share funds are a very unique, uh, very unique um, structure. It is a, a closed end fund and they call it a split because there's actually two classes of shares. There's the preferred shares. These are very conservative 
And then there's the capital shares or the class A shares. The preferred shares, they, their NAV does not move at all. It's almost kind of like a, a bond, like a fixed in, income instrument where they have the priority on the dividends. They have the top priority over, over everything. So they'll typically, the preferred shares will have a five-year five term. They will get, let's say, 5% yield. But if, let's say, the share prices start going up or the dividends start increasing, the preferred shares capture none of it. So it's very, very stable. It's not vol volatile at all. And after five years, you could actually hand in back your shares at $10. So typically, the preferred shares are stay at about $10. Uh, and you can literally hand them back in, just like a, like a bond. You could give it back, right? When you give it back to a corporation or the government, you, you're guaranteed that money. It, it's almost like, like a bond. So that's the preferred share. It's a really nice alternative, I would say, to some things like a, like a GIC, because you could get about 5%, but the advantage is it's not interest income, it's dividend, eligible dividend income. So it's much, much more tax efficient. And it doesn't participate in any of the stock movements of the portfolio. That all goes to the class A shares. So the class A shares capture the leftover dividends once the preferred shares are paid, plus the covered calls. They're also writing covered calls. Typically on a split share fund writes covered calls as well. All the covered call income and any of the capital gains or losses goes to the class A shares. So that is where the leverage comes in. It's not, they're not borrowing money. The leverage, it's called synthetic leverage. It's how the fund is structured that because the preferred, they're splitting it in half and the preferred shares are not capturing any of the movement, that all goes to the class A shares. It's amplified, it's leveraged. So a big advantage of that is that if interest rates go up, doesn't impact that leverage because it's not borrowed money. So that's the main advantage of a split share fund. And on the stock market, you're going to have, you know, let, we'll take an example, ABC. So if you see ABC split share, that's typically class A share. If you see ABC.PR or ABCPR, which stands for preferred, that's going to be the stock ticker for the preferred share. So they have different tickers, same portfolio of stocks, different objectives, different risk levels as well. So it sounds like they are pretty unique funds. Is there any unique benefits and risks to consider for split funds? With a split share fund, because there's two tickers, there's a unit nav. So if you take the net asset value or the value of the preferred shares, which is always typically about $10, that never moves because it doesn't capture anything, and you add the nav of the class A shares together, that's called the unit nav. It's the unit nav or the unit value of the fund when you combine the preferred shares and the preferred shares and the class A shares, right? So all split funds, most of them, I think 99% of them have this rule. If the unit nav is less than $15, they're not going to pay out the monthly distribution to the class A shareholder. The preferred shareholder is always protected. There is a risk if you're a class A shareholder of sometimes missing dividends but that depends on the fund manager, the fund, and you, you got to do your research to see in the whole history of this fund or split share fund class A shares, how many dividends did it miss? You know, if, it, if it's missing two to three dividends a year on average, you got to expect to miss two to three dividends on average. Yes, you could get these crazy 16, 18% yields. That's always fantastic. And that's typically what drives people to the class A shares, but you got to be mindful of that $15 unit nav rule. Well, great. Thanks for that example. That uh, definitely clarifies it on the split share funds. I hope so. All right. It does for me anyway. Hopefully our, our audience as well. <laughs> so one thing, no matter where we turn right now, Adrian, we always hear about interest rates. So uh, interest yeah. rates have been on the rise in Canada and in the US in response to high inflation. But how might this dynamic impact the performance of leverage funds? Well, um, it could negatively impact them if they're taking classic leverage. That puts pressure. The leverage gets a little bit more expensive, right? But the, the prime thing you need to look at is how is interest rates impacting the stocks inside the fund? It's always got to look at what you're investing in. 
So obviously, you we know quite clearly that interest rates going up or spiking up puts a lot of pressure on more of the growth speculative stocks like the tech sector. But it could help, you know, some some staple stocks or if the ETF is still getting a yield that's higher than the cost of the interest or of the leverage, you're okay. It's only if it starts to get break even where it, it doesn't really it kind of mitigates the whole purpose of the leverage. And if let's say interest rates, I don't know, it goes back, we go back like in the eighties where it's at like 10 or I think it was at 20% or something insane like that. I don't think we'll get to that point, but who knows? Then it, the, they might be in trouble. With the higher interest rates right now, there there is the concern about a possible global recession on the horizon. So I know you've you know convinced me at least anyway too, that you're sticking with leverage funds that you like. You know, what gives you the confidence to do that given the potential for higher market volatility? So this is why I really love the cover cost strategy. I consider it a defensive strategy. And like we discussed before, it really shines during flat, volatile, or down markets. That's when covered call ETFs typically do better than the equivalent without the, the covered calls in, in that time frame. If the market's flat or going down and you're writing calls, the calls are not going to be exercised. So you're keeping those premiums while keeping your shares. Plus that leverage gives you a higher yield. And another thing to remember is that volatility options, when you sell options, what, what price is in how much an option is worth and how much or how much premium you could get, it's volatility. The, the more volatile the stock market is, the richer the options are, the more premiums you could get, right? Just like if you're a 20-year-old that gets insurance for a 1000 cc super sport motorcycle your premium is going to be a lot a lot a lot higher right a lot yeah. higher the insurance company has to charge you a lot more because there's more of a risk there's a lot more risk that you'll get into an accident versus you know a, a 65 year old uh, or 70 year old senior who has a flawless driving record the covered call etfs have that cushion or have that defense of that increased options premium, that increased um, income that you're getting, whereas let's say an index fund, like an S&P 500, you're only getting about one and a half percent yield. Most of the return is literally coming from the stock price. Not You're barely not getting any income. So covered call ETFs actually shine during flat or down markets, which is why uh, you know I especially like them. It, it, it helps me keep my cool and keeps my composure and to sleep well at night because that's when these strategies typically shine. Yeah, I love the insurance analogy. I have an 18-year-old son and his uh, his insurance is much higher than mine. And I think probably for good reason. <laughs> right, exactly. Uh, all right. We've talked a lot about how leverage funds work and, and what you look for when considering them. Now, let's take a moment to hop into WebBroker to demonstrate how to search for leverage funds. So if you go into WebBroker and you click on research and you go to screeners, you're going to get this screen that we're seeing right now or the, the um, screener stocks page. So you're going to want to click on ETFs to get to um, just a, a more of a category that we're looking for. We're looking for exchange traded funds. And I've already created a few screens just to uh, make it a little bit quicker in terms of this demonstration. But I want to show you how you would go from the beginning to create a custom screen. You click on create custom screen. I'm going to just go into this one here. I'm going to go into the view matches. This is one that I've created that looks for both Canadian and U.S. covered call and enhanced ETFs. When you're doing it from scratch, you're going to click on create custom screen, but it's a very similar process. So if I go into this view matches, you can see I'm going to click on edit screen to get to the, the point that you would be using if you were going to create a new screen. It would automatically pull up the country if you're going to have Canada and the United States. And then you're going to select one of these categories so, or one of these selections here. I'm going to click on fund category, go click to add criteria. I've already done that, so that's down at the bottom here. And these are a few uh, categories that you can that can save you the time of searching for these. You can look for alternative equity focused. You can look for derivative income, Canadian dividend and income equity. So if you add all those from this long drop down, you're going to get about 79 results. And it's going to cover so far from what I've researched most of the either leveraged ETFs or covered call ETFs that are available within WebBroker. There might be some other criteria, but I would say you can go do a Google search, find a particular ETF that you might be interested in that fits that particular um, style of investing. And if you put the quote into Web Broker, it'll tell you the actual category that would be used within the screen. So if there are some additional ones, you can definitely do that as well. 
But if I click on the view 79 matches, I'm going to get a list of all 79. It may be on, on multiple pages, but now I can do a comparison. I can compare up to five at a time if I click these boxes here. I can click on the individual ETFs themselves and go into more detail. It's going to give me an overview. Some of the things like the top holdings that Adrian talked about or the management expense fee and all kinds of information on each individual ETFs before you make your decision there. All right, Adrian, we're going to have to leave it there. Thanks for filling us in on how leverage funds work and your approach to using them as an income investor. You've given our viewers a great jumping off point for their own research into these funds. And is there any final thoughts on leverage funds you'd like to share? Do your research, know what you're investing in and how they work. And the number one thing is what's inside the fund. Look at what they're actually putting leverage on. Uh, how much is the leverage, right? 25% is fairly modest. You got to be ready to hold these long term. That's typically the best strategy. And if they're putting leverage on quality, it should be okay. Just like when you buy a house and you have a 25 year mortgage, it's a quality asset that you're holding on to for the long term. So have that same mentality and you should be okay. And if you're not comfortable with it, there's plenty of unleveraged options out there you could start with. Do your research, ask your questions first. And, uh, you know, you got to make the decision for yourself. All right. Well, thanks again for joining us, Adrian. And for those in our audience, make sure to register for our upcoming live webinars and check out our library of on-demand content available in the Learning Center and on our YouTube page. See you all next time.